You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid conversations with the healthcare industry's top physicians, executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. I am one of your hosts, Cameron Steinheimer, and I am the marketing manager here at Pacific Companies. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Doc Lounge podcast by Pacific Companies. I'm your host, Stacey Doyle, Senior Director of Marketing. Uh, thank you for tuning into our Ask the Expert series. Our special guest today is Dr. Paul Bass. Dr. Bass is co-founder and director of Fortune Man- Management, America's largest and most comprehensive healthcare practice management organization with the motto of Extraordinary Practice, Extraordinary Life. And Dr. Bass has practiced for for over 21 years. Um, I'm so excited to have you on. Welcome, Dr. Bass. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I'm also joined today by my co-host, Lisa Shabaro. She is the Director of Business Development at Pacific Companies. Stacy, Dr. Bass, good morning. Good morning again, Lisa. Well, welcome, Dr. Bass. I'd love for you to just tell our listeners a little bit more about your journey um, and, and really what led you to co-found uh, Fortune Management. Wow. Well, I, I am one of the co-founders of Fortune Management, but I need to tell you where this whole journey started, actually. I practiced for about nine years, not having a clue what I was doing. And I'm, I'm talking about from a business standpoint. There's really no explanation for why it would be this way, but there is no healthcare platform educational process that gives any doctor of, of whether it's chiropractic, medical, dental, optometry, no substantial practice management information at all. You, because they got so much time and you know they got to get teach you all the medical stuff, right? So you graduate, you go out and good luck. Well, I I was always really in the first several years, for the first nine years, actually, I watched the statistics on practice development. I started in some of the national magazines. And what I noticed is my practice was always in the top 10% as far as, you know, promotion, collection, yada, yada, yada. But here's the dichotomy. I was also going to the bank on a fairly regular basis to take a cash advance so that I could take that cash put it in the next tell's window here to go into my business account to cover the payroll checks that I was about to go back to the office and write. And that's a bit disconcerting. That is. And it was actually nine years into my professional career that a good friend of mine called me and he said, Hey, Paul, I want, I want to take you to a seminar. And of course I thought, well, that's great. You know, what, what, uh, what uh, courses are we going to play? <laughs> he said, no, 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 it's not that good of a seminar where you, you, know, you check in and you go play golf. So uh, bottom line, this particular gentleman was a part of an of a, of a early organization in, in, in coaching, actually. And that organization was with Quest Seminars International Company, okay? Quest Seminars International. He invited me to go to a seminar, and I was, you know, what you, what you know, you know, right? And what you don't know, if you have an awareness and you don't know it, then you don't care to learn about it. Well, then that's... But the stuff that you didn't know you didn't know, that's the powerful stuff, right? So I go, I go to this Quest Quest Seminars uh, International event. It was in Dallas, Texas, as a matter of fact. And an interesting thing happened on there. First of all, I heard just countless ideas that would solve many of the problems I had going on in my practice. So uh, as a matter of fact, I can tell you that, and I'm nine years in, from the first session of the Quest Seminars International event, my practice doubled in 60 days. Wow. Now, I told you a moment ago, I was already in the top 10%. Yeah. It doubled in 60 days. And the, the people who were there were just, you know, they were they were just pioneers of practice management. And so that became, and of course, I came on board. They asked me to be part of their staff after I went through the program. They said, you, you know, you, you got a lot of great ideas on your own. I said, well, I appreciate it, but I've learned most of them from you guys. So anyway, the bottom line is uh, I was asked to join Quest Seminars International Lecturing, the national uh, lecturing team. And I was, uh, I was very, very excited to be in, in that capacity for, I guess it was probably six years or so. 
And then all of a sudden, I had an opportunity to meet Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins. Oh, wow. And the way that happened was kind of was kind of interesting. He, um, I, had, I, I read his book. My college roommate gave me a copy of Unlimited Power, his first book. You guys haven't read that book? It's a, it's a dynamite book. So I read Unlimited Power, and I immediately made a decision. I want to meet this guy. He knows something that I don't know, right? So I called Robbins Research International, and I said, uh, I, 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 I want to take Tony's seminar. And they said, well, he's, he has numerous ones. Which would you like to take? And I said, Unlimited Power Weekend, the one that has the firewall in it. They said, well, okay, great. We'll send you. This was in the old fax days, right? They said, we'll fax, fax your schedule and see what matches, and uh, we'd, be, we'd love to have you. Well, the schedule came in, and as I said to me a moment ago, I was already doing seminars all over the U.S. and Canada. And so I got, and I couldn't wait to get the list, right, and compare it to what dates I had open. Every single date for the next year that he was doing a seminar, I was also doing a seminar. It's crazy. So it's like, okay, well, there's got to be a, there's got to be a different way to go about this, right? So I called back, I thought about it, and I called back out there, and I said, well, I'll tell you what. Would he, you t- would he be willing to come and do a seminar for me? And they said, well, he does that. I mean, you know, we, we, they would send the, you know, the entire seminar team, the, the, the people that do the fire thing back in the, in the, in the back of the hotel, uh, the parking lot. And long story short, I said, okay, great. Send it to him. Send me the contract. And they said, they said his fee, and this, this was in those days, right? His fee is $20,000 a day. That's a two and a half day seminar. So that will actually be a total of $50,000. And of course, remember me, I'm the one going and getting cash advances. Right? Right. right. So, but I was, I was already into the, I was already had been in quest and learned a ton of stuff. So I was no longer taking cash advances. But the, but the point is um, I contacted 50 of my doctors and I told them just sight unseen. I told them what I would like them to do is join me for a for a, a, a life changing seminar in Atlanta, Georgia, at the perimeter, uh, Peachtree Perimeter, Marriott, or whatever, uh, with a gentleman named Tony Robbins. Now these were already clients of mine; they totally trusted me. I said, "What I need you to do here are the dates. Please put these on your calendar. Send me a check for a thousand dollars, and that will get you and your wife into the event." And bottom line, believe it or not, all 50 of them sent in a check for $1,000. So the event, the event took place. They were just amazed. The very first night, he does the firewall, right? Now, of course, I brought all these people here. So they build this fire out in the parking lot right behind the hotel. And I've got, I go out there, and it's like, okay, and everybody's you know ready to roll. And so the first person that goes across the firewalk is Tony. He always leads the way, right? So the, and then all of a sudden it dawned on me. I had one of those oh moments, right? I was he, Tony goes through this the, all the burning embers. I mean, this stuff is real. Trust me. And all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, I brought these people. I've got to go next. <laughs> so I just followed the instructions that he had given us, went right through it, and uh, never never felt heat. There was no there was no perception of heat. I was walking. It felt like if you dumped uh, a big vat of popcorn from the theater on the on the floor and walked walked through it, it'd be like crunch, crunch, crunch. Now these are red embers, right? So bottom line, it was uh, it was a it was a phenomenal phenomenal experience. And the next day after that that evening, the firewalk event, and that was only part of what he did that evening. The next day, I told him uh, at, at one of the breaks, I said, "Hey, Tony." The uh, the restaurant here in the hotel is going to be slammed with all the participants because there are probably other events going on here too. Would you would you and Becky, that was his wife at that point in time, would you guys like to hop in the car and go across to the Perimeter Center Mall and go to you know Fridays or you know whatever and grab some lunch so we're you know and having to wait on a table? He said, "Yeah, sure, that'd be great." Well, pulling out of the parking lot, I mean it's two or three hundred yards across the parking lot, and I'm pulling out of the hotel parking lot. And I said, Tony, what's the purpose of your organization? He said, to bring the greatest transformation to the, to the largest number of people in the shortest period of time. He just rattled it off, right? And I was like, wow, this guy, this guy's directed. He knows, he knows what he's up to. And then here comes this next question. 
Well, I'm curious, Tony, do you do you think that having a branch in healthcare would support the fulfillment of your vision? Whoa. He didn't say anything for about 15 seconds. And then he said, we, we need to talk. And because uh, he had already, by the way, he, he's interested, very interesting guy. He had already talked to a bunch of our clients the night before and also that morning on breaks. And he said, yeah, let's let's talk. So he said, can you get your whole, I was chairman of the board of, of Quest at that point in time. They said, can you get your whole team to an event at the castle? This is the Tony Robbins castle, which is, he doesn't live there anymore. Out in uh, I-5 from L.A., Del Mar. I said, I think I, I think I probably could. Of course, the other people on, on my board, they didn't know who Tony Robbins was, right? So short, long story short, I told them what was going on. I said, you guys got to come. We got to go do this thing. And uh, it was a three-day event there uh, in in, uh, in Del Mar. And by the end of that event, the whole board was saying, we, we got, we need to, we need to, uh, we need to team up with this guy. So we created Fortune Management. It was actually just a part of the, in fact, it was the entire Quest Seminars International Organization plus Tony. So we had Quest uh, Ventures Incorporated and Robbins Ventures Incorporated. It was a two, you know, it was a partnership, two party partnership. And immediately went to work and have not even slowed down since. I mean, uh, literally changing lives, making things better. And it's not just about the lives of the practitioners or their staff members. It's the lives of the patients. It's the patients who come in to an environment in which we have put a spirit of hospitality in place. And a, a spirit of hospitality, you know, people sometimes ask me, what do you mean by spirit of hospitality? It, it, it is a well-orchestrated process that we assist doctors in putting together so that every doc, every patient who comes in the front door or calls in on the telephone has the most remarkable experience they have ever had in a medical practice. I love that. And, and one of the things that I've noticed is, you know, going back to when we first kicked off and we talked about extraordinary practice extraordinary life. Tell us a little bit about that motto. I think you were just getting in motto, getting into that. Extraordinary about, practice, extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary life. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it starts with financial freedom. We don't do what we do for money, nor do our doctors. They may have been, you know, you know, money people. I was in the beginning. That's why I wanted to go to dental school. We had a dentist that lived right behind us. He always had a brand new Cadillac every year. And I thought that's pretty cool. I think I'll be a dentist. Uh, the, the, so bottom line, we assist people in transforming their relationships, not just with their staff, but also with their patients. And we use the specific tools that Tony, when we started this company, it's 33 years ago. And we put conflict resolution communication tools in place that are absolutely bulletproof. There are there are four of those. The very first one is a, is a is a process called a reality check. And Lisa, I imagine you probably have heard of the reality check, have you not? With people, yeah. it's it's seven questions. We it, it hasn't been altered at all from the day we created the company. Seven questions, and if we're truly honest with ourselves, and these set seven questions that we would always ask if we're if we have a frustration, anything from a mild annoyance or mild frustration all the way up to rage and anger. So it covers the whole gamut. One of two things will happen by answering these seven questions. And every Fortune practice uh, management uh, office actually has a stack of these in two or three places. So if anybody's upset. They can go get it, answer the questions, and one of two things will happen. Your upset will either vanish or it will at least diminish, both of which are good. And if I'm your next patient, right, I'd like you to go. If you're upset about something, I'd, I'd prefer you go do that reality check before you come work on me. Does that make sense? Because you're going to be in a better place. So the, the communication tools uh, are just part of the culture that we create. It all, it all starts with culture. Okay. Our relationships, how we communicate with our patients, how they communicate with one another. And uh, all I can tell you is Tony's, Tony's uh, the creation of those tools that he put in here, they're copyrighted. You know, we keep those within the company. 
I've told you one of two things will happen. The upset's either gone or it's at least diminished. And it takes five minutes or less to answer these seven questions. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So I can go right back now in that treatment room and feel totally different, right? If, however, if, if, it's, if it's vanished, fantastic. That happens frequently. And I'll tell you a couple stories from seminars that I did uh, in which that happened. And it's, it's it, the whole room is like, whoa, what just happened? Uh, <laughs> So, but it, but it all starts with ha having communication tools. That's one of the four components of the, of the culture, right? So the communication tools assist us in diminishing people's upsets immediately. And then there are follow-up tools to use. If, for example, somebody on a scale of one to 10 was a level eight upset and they do a reality check and now it's only a level two, they're in much better shape. But guess what? It's, it's not handled yet, right? So there are secondary tools that we use to have the two people get together and they're very, very empowering tools. There's no make wrong. They don't, they're not, you know, they're not judgmental parts. I mean, the parts are not judgmental. We're basically having an open, honest, loving conversation with one of our team members, right? At that, and that, the, that, combination of quality request and quality response always ends in solution that, that works for everybody. Very, very cool. Um, so when we, when we start working with an office, the first thing that we do is assist them in creating a shared vision in the practice, a shared vision. Okay. You know, I've done a lot of seminars. I quit counting at 4,000. I mean, seminars, workshops, all over the U.S. and Canada. And uh, we, by the way, at this point in time, Stacey, you may not know this, but at this point in time, we have around 135, 140 executive level coaches who are all over North America teaching what we do, right? And they basically, we trained them to exactly the standards that we've had. And it works out really nicely. Um, so I'm in a seminar. This one was in actually, uh, it was a, this was a dental seminar. It was in the Canadian Dental Association in Montreal. I do the reality check. In fact, I'm, I, I put the reality check in every seminar I do. If they want to talk, talk about profitability, I make sure I find a way to slide the reality check in there because the value of that process is, is amazing. So when I'm doing this in a, in a room of people, what I, uh, uh, ask each of them to do is think of them one of the biggest upsets they've ever had in their entire life. Okay. And the, the, we pass out the forms, this Canadian dental association uh, meeting that I was at, uh, there was probably 300 doctors in the room. And after I teach them the process, I mean, it's only seven questions. After I walk them through that, I say, okay, now I'm going to just close down here for about five, six minutes while you guys complete this process. And I'd like to find out what you discover. So I'm silent, right? I wait and I'm watching the time about five or six minutes later. I'll say, how many people need a few more minutes? Okay, great. I'll give you a couple more minutes. When they're all complete, I ask, I say, oh, okay. I now have, I have a question for each of you. How many of you found that as you did this process, the upset you had totally vanished. Raise your hand, please. That is usually, I've, I've been doing my own survey watching. It's usually about 20% gone. And I'll tell you one of those stories, a couple of those stories here in just a moment. So, and by the way, you want to know how medical practices work? The way you would make them work is we clean up relationships and we give people clarity and communications, right? And of course, yes, that does include the patients. So, uh, I said, how many people found your upset totally vanished? About 20% of the room went up, about 60, 60 people or so. And I said, okay, so how many people would say your upset at least diminished? Raise your hands also along with the other guys, right? It's, it's virtually 100% all the time. The only time somebody is off track, they didn't understand the process or something. And I always volunteer to, you know, like lunch break, stop, come to me, and I'll be happy to work through that with you. Um, so the bottom line is there, when I'm, wa I'm watching the room and they're, they're just people. And again, I think I'm divinely called to, to be, to know exactly where to go to. There was a lady sitting about three rows back from the stage. Okay. And so she was one of the ones who said the upset was totally gone. Right. 
There was also, on the very last row, there was a little old dentist back there, big white beard. He looked like Santa Claus. So I, was, I, I called on this lady. I said, could we get a mic up? I think you're one of those people who said that you're upset, totally vanished. She said, oh, yes, it's gone. So she, I said, let's bring this lady a microphone. They came up with it. One of the mic runners brought her, brought her mic. And I said, so uh, I, for the benefit of everybody in the room, I'd like to ask a question. You said the upset is gone. What was the level of upset? Before you did this reality check, she said, oh, it was a 10. A scale of one to 10, it was a, if I just pray a 10 plus. I said, well, that's fantastic. And you're telling me it's now a, a zero. And she said, yes, it's gone. I said, what, when did this, when did this happen? She said, it, it happened when I was a little girl. I said, how did you vanish something like that in about five minutes? She said, well, it was question number such and such. She said, I just never looked at it from the other person's perspective. I don't know what happened to her. The bottom line, though, is it was a massive, massive upset that's been with her. She was probably in her mid-30s, 40 possibly. That kind of, that, and of course, you just hear the room's like, whoa. <laughs> so I called, I looked back in the back, and I see the my buddy back there with that big white beard. I said, by the way, you, sir. On the very last, very last row, a big white beard. I love your beard. It's fabulous. Uh, could you guys get him a mic? And I, I said, you, I believe you were the one of the ones that said you're upset totally that. She said, oh, yes. It, it's, it's all. I said, great. So let's let's talk about that. What was your level of upset before you did the, this process? He said, on a scale of 1 to 10? I said, yes, sir. He said, probably at 12. <laughs> I said, who, who was, who was this upset with? I'm just curious. He said it was with my son. I said, wow. And you're telling me it's now gone. Wow. How many years has it been there? You know, I've been at two, I mean, I think it was 10 years, maybe. I said, talk to him in 10 years. I said, so you're telling me it's totally gone. He said, what I'm telling you is I cannot wait to get out of this room and call my son. That was a quote. How do you think that makes me feel? How do you think that reflects on our company? I mean, people who get involved with us, who do the things that we teach them to do, get massive results. And it doesn't just start with the money. How do you make more money? I think I told you in my Quest seminar, I believe I told you this, in that, in that first seminar I went to, it was the first of a four-series program. My practice doubled in 60 days. Did I mention that? 60 days. Well, how do you, how how is that possible? Well, it's possible because they taught me for one thing how to schedule productively, not to work harder, not to rush, but to use the appropriate amount of time. You know how most doctors, put, if I I was in the same category, if you have an appointment book that has fifteen minute increments on there, guess what? <laughs> you, the patient, you know, the the staff writes a name on every line without any concept of, well, I wonder how much time that procedure would take. And that, that was one of the things that I learned from a really, really good friend of mine to this day, Dr. Tom McDougal from Dallas. He was president of Dallas County. Have you ever heard of him? He's pretty famous in the Dallas area, Dr. Tom McDougal. And uh, so, so what are the four parts of the, what are the four parts of the, of the culture? Number one is creating a shared vision. I'm going to share with you a, a shared vision statement that a team created, and I'll tell you about that team in a moment also. Uh, a shared vision. And every time I'm talking about a vision statement, I'll ask the doctors in the room, raise your hand if you have a vision statement in your office. And it, quite honestly, it's usually only about 20%, which is sad. And then I'll ask them, how many of you um, keep your hand up, by the way, if, if you did not create it, but you had your team, uh, your team work together to create it. And almost invariably, there may be one or two doctors who say it's still up. So think about this. They, they, a doctor, either a solo practitioner or a, you know, a, a group practice, the doctors create and articulate a vision statement. Now, what are they going to do with that? Well, they bring it in the next staff meeting, they give it to their team and say, okay, this is our vision statement. Everybody go home and memorize this. Here's my question. Does, does the team have any ownership in that vision, a shared vision statement? They have no ownership. How do you get ownership? You help create it. 
So there's a process by which we assist people in practices in creating a shared vision that the team is a part of creating. Once you have that vision statement, and I'm going to give you an example. By the way. I've decided to bring one of these out now to give you. This is uh, this is from the uh, Geffen Cancer Center and Research Institute in Vero Beach, Florida. Dr. Geffen was a very, very dear friend of mine. He's passed away actually from cancer, ironically. But I, I worked with him his entire career from the time he opened his practice. My first meeting with him was uh, determining how much office furniture we would be able to rent to put in this reception area. It's a true story. Tony, Tony Robbins, he's a friend of Tony's, and he, Tony referred him, referred him to me. And so I worked with him all the way to the very end of his professional career. He was, in fact, the number one mind-body connection uh, wow. oncologist in the world. Guy was beyond brilliant. Well, we go in, and what do I do there? Well, I assist them in an exercise whereby they create a shared vision. This whole team participated in it. I'm going to read it to you, and then I'll tell you what he did with it that really leveraged the power that's right here on this page that created ma massive, massive number of patients come into your practice. Okay, so here's the vision statement. Our vision is to provide the highest quality health care available anywhere in the world and to transform the quality of life of our patients and their loved ones. He had counseling for, for, for family members. Transform um, the quality of life of our patients and their loved ones in profound ways. We offer meticulous, uncompromising, state-of-the-art state medical care with a commitment to honoring and caring for the beauty, importance, and sovereignty of ourselves and every person we have the privilege to serve with love, joy, compassion, and ultimate respect. Now, what did they do? I mean, that blows you away, doesn't it? I mean, what would you do? How would you feel if you walked into an office? You've just been diagnosed, Okay. You walk into an oncology practice. When you walk in the door, I'm going to sh share with you now how, how they displayed this. You walk in the door, ficus trees, beautiful, beautiful facility, highly polished marble floor. And as you walk in, you see over on the opposite wall, there are these lights shining down on something that's hanging up on that wall, right? It was this vision statement that was scripted in like the large frame that they made, like, like, you know, uh, you couldn't find a picture frame that big. So they used, you know, basically big pieces of, it, it was nicely done, pieces of wood that, that, so you couldn't help but see this thing, right? So what well, people walk in the front door, they've just been diagnosed and they read this. Our vision is to provide the highest quality healthcare label anywhere in the world. I mean, how would you feel, Stacy, if you just walked in the door, diagnosed, probably scared stiff, right? What is that? What? How does that make you feel? It's like, yeah, this is. I, I'm glad I came here. I just got, I just got here, and to transform the quality of life of our patients and their loved ones in profound ways, we offer meticulous, uncompromising, state-of-the-art medical care. The commitment to honoring and caring for the beauty importance and sovereignty of ourselves and every person we have the privilege to serve with love, joy, compassion, and ultimate respect. It's a human, you know, it takes away just the medical, you know, you realize we're all just humans. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have human beings who work here. Okay. So that's the first thing we do is assist the team in creating a shared vision and the input from every single team member goes into this. And we do that by using what, by highlighting what we call emotion evoking words. And you've heard tons of emotion evoking words throughout that whole process. Meticulous, uncompromising, state of the art. Every person we slip serve with love, joy, compassion, and ultimate. You see what I'm saying? So that really touches people and it wins their confidence before they've ever even met the team or the doctor, right? So the shared vision. Now, how do you pull that off? When we have a team that completes a shared vision, they like, whoa, that's it. I mean, 
it took them about 90 days to do this. When I taught them the process, about 90 days later, it was spit shined and polished. And they were like, okay, Paul, we got it. Here's the final product. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just stunning. So you stop and think about, okay, so this is their vision statement. The team created it. So how do you pull it off? How do you make that actually happen? How do you bring that and call it into existence? Well, there has to be a set of what I call agreements. You could call them operating principles, whereby the staff, the whole team who created this vision statement creates a set of, of behavioral, sta uh, pa uh, behavioral standards whereby they're going to power. How are we going to play this game? And the set of agreements is only is only locked in when every single person can agree on every single agreement. Then you've got the right set of agreements, right? And we don't put them in the reception area. Right? We put them in the in the kitchen, right? So when the team comes through there, they can see those. So share vision, agreements. Number three, communications. That's the communication tools that I had shared with you uh, about earlier. And so what's number four? There, there are four cornerstones of what we're talking about here, which is your culture, right? Shared vision, agreements, communications, and number four is relationships. And the good news about number four is you don't have to do anything to create it because if all the work was done in those first three. Now, you guys may have a question about about. This whole process. That's how we start working in an office. Any questions at all about that that I could help you with? So, so I'm I'm thinking, and I'm wondering, Stacy, if your brain is lighting up to where I'm going with this. So, we've had a few people on here, um, neuropsychologists. We've also had Dr. Jordan Cooper, who authored a book. Yourself, you fit beautifully, because where I come into the picture, and my interest in all this is how to make practices more recruitable right? Because at some point we are going to talk yes. about financially. It can't always just be about who's offering the most money, right? What hospital can give me the biggest paycheck ever? Because guess what? It's no longer the thing that everyone is right. basing their decision on. And Stacy's told this story a few times, but, but I had a small hospital that we relocated a physician from a major metro right. to a small rural and the difference was all of those things that you just talked about. And so my interest is for our listeners, for our audience, for our physicians and practices to learn how to become this kind of a practice, because you're right. It absolutely benefits yes, not just the physician, the success, the financial prosperity will come with it, but also the yes. patients they're serving. I always think if I drove through this community one day and, and just by current of luck, something happened to me, would I feel welcomed, comfortable in seeking out care right. at that hospital or at that community? And I love to be able to say, absolutely, yes, absolutely, yes. So that's where in putting it all this together, it just marries beautifully um, what you're touching on and, and what Stacy and I have been focused on here lately. Um, they, they just all married well. Yes. And what would create that for you is, is all the things that are part of this that creates that spirit of hospitality. So think about this. Does it make practices grow? There of course it does. Because a patient experiences something outstanding. This is not just good stuff, right? This is, this is, this is outstanding. The best, right? So a patient walks out of that appointment. Let's say he's not an oncologist. That was a little bit, <laughs> that was a little more serious. Let's just say it's, you know, use your imagination. They're in any medical practice. They leave and they're going to go back to bridge club. What are they going to be talking around the bridge table about? Or if it's a guy, he goes out to meet his guy and his foursome. You know, they teed off about an hour ago. He's meeting them on the back nine, whatever. And guess what he's talking to? Man, I tell you what, it was worth my while not to be on the first several holes because I got to tell you guys about this medical practice I was just in. This is called marketing, but it's not done to create money. This is a very subtle point, but I want to make sure that, that we hit it really, really hard. Fortune management, it practices or practice management or coaching or whatever you want to call it, is not about making more money. And yes, it creates more money. Does that make sense? 
it, it gets you not not because what happens is the practices grow like crazy. So um, I hope that helps you see the the application. It, I would go as far as to say, Lisa, that there is probably not a practicing physician in the country who, first of all, has access to what we have, but secondly, doesn't need it. And that's been a big theme, you know, throughout a lot of our most recent podcasts is really just this exposure to really running yes. your practice like a business, both on the financial piece where you, you may not have had that money management tools. And then really this is more management. This is more, um, you know, people management, learning how to really, you know, have those relationships right. and how do you build that within, you know, a, a corporate or business culture. So I, I'm so, I think that this is, would really resonate with our audience. And I'd love you to just maybe hit on what are a few pitfalls and mistakes you kind of have commonly seen when you've been helping uh, practices and, and how they can, you know, kind of counterbalance some of those. I would say discord, conflict, lack of attention to detail. When we suggest that people put certain things in place, first of all, if they're in a coaching relationship with us, Stacy. I mean, I should, I should back, you'll understand why I'm going to say what I'm going to say when I tell you this. What's the difference between a coach and a consultant? Our company is coaches. But the 140 or whatever we have all over the place, those people are, are executive level coaches. We have trained them incredibly well. Our training program is absolutely impeccable, right? That's coaching. Now, lots of people have consultants. What's the role of a consultant? Comes into the office quarterly, semi-annually, annually, whatever you want, you know, maybe even bi-monthly. Come into your office and you have a topic or two you've asked them to cover. They come in, they do the, they do the, the gig, right? And they leave you the manual and say, so you get in three months. Then it's incumbent on the doctor and his team. And of course, if the doctor hasn't put a team together the way we do, they're going to look at you like, what are you talking about? You know? So it's incumbent on, it's incumbent on the coach. Again, a consultant just talks to you and leaves you the stuff and I'll see you in three months. That makes sense? A coach is literally a hand holding relationship. Not that we treat these kids like babies. They're not, they're not babies, but we hold their hand through the entire process of implementation of every single thing we teach. Which does, Stacy, include all the business systems. It includes all the numbers, all of everything. We've we've been doing this for a long, long time. And the point is, a coach. We have typically most of most of our coaches. I, this is how I work. I tell you that for sure. Twice a month, I am on a coaching call or Zoom call with my client, and it's not just with the doctor. I don't want it to be just to the doctor. Because then what gets to the staff is 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 watered down by what did he not understand I said, right? Or what did, what dropped out? What did he not? So I want the whole team on the calls, right? So it's me and the doctors and the entire thing. And my role as a coach, in fact, all of our coaches, our, the role that we have as coaches is to find out what the doctor's vision is. If he or she does not have a vision yet, well, we help them think about, well, if anything were possible, what would you want to accomplish? And they're like, oh, my gosh. Because so many people are in, you know, just learned helplessness, you know. I, I think that what, what most people in our society need is just a, you know, it's just a shot in the arm. You know, they're, we, have gimpy, we have gimpy muscles when it comes to paying attention to detail and doing the things that we're taught. I don't, I, I make certain that when I'm coaching a, a team, that it is locked in, it is absolutely impeccable by paying meticulous attention to detail, and that's what gets the result, right? When people start getting sloppy in your business, when people start not start not paying attention to what their the key directives, what happens? Yeah, it, it starts to show, and this is something that I recently touched on with one of my clients. I, I, I mentioned to them that Recruiting actually starts at the front desk. The person at the front desk who answers the physician's call, your office manager's call that you're trying to hire, it starts at the front desk and, and it goes from there. It's that attention to detail, being polite, greeting them, 
And having a shared vision, I feel like, allows these people to buy into the fact that this is who we are as an organization and we want more of the same. Because I can't tell you how many practices I've walked into where you just feel so unwelcome simply because the front desk person's having a bad day. And so maybe I'll carry those sheets with me. Oh, um, sorry about that. Uh, there, um, there are several practices where you walk in and you can feel that tension. You can feel almost unwelcomed. And it's simply because that person may not be aware of their role within the big picture. Maybe they're not having a bad day. Maybe it's just that's the way they wear their face. But it's giving a perception to someone that they're maybe not welcomed. Um, there's not warmth in joining this team. And so by having a shared vision of, hey, this is the goal. This is who we are. We're welcoming. I'm thinking of that oncologist as, as I'm saying this, you know, just that that environment of warmth and hospitality, um, I think is the word you use. So creating that kind of environment, but it does truly start the moment you pick up the phone, the moment, you know, someone walks into your office, not only recruiting, you know, staff, but also recruiting patients. And so that's where all this is going with my mind. You're absolutely right. And what does it, what does it say to the patients when they walk in and you've got this glass door, you have to slide open before you can talk with them and they don't even give you eye contact, right? They're like, you know, here, sign, I mean, uh, yeah, put your name, name and address, yada, yada, yada. What's the glass? Do? I, I think most patients probably think the glass must be there so I don't know what they're talking to, to with the, one or another about about me, right? Where do you think that glass needs to go? Where does it need to go? <laughs> In the trash. Yes. I'll never forget the first. I went into an office in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I asked the doctor before I did this. I would never do anything so so blunt without making sure the doctor understood. Said and So I said, Doc, you you know, I'm imagining, because you had me come in here live to do this thing, you, you know that I've been around the block a few times, and I would imagine you know I would not make any recommendation to you is not in your best interest. Is that true for you or are you not sure? He said, oh, no, I, I totally trust you. I said, well, that's the word I was looking for. Okay. So I uh, took the first break. I took the entire glass mechanism. I put it in the dumpster and made certain that it broke. It's a true story. I made certain that it shattered. And so they all come back from the break and the, it's open. I said, guess what? Now you and your patients can communicate. It's just, it's, it's just, we, we put up barriers for patients to have to climb over or, or, you know, around it's craziness because creating a spirit of hospitality is so simple. It, well, it's not totally simple. You know, they didn't learn it in medical school, but they have people, us, who know exactly how to do it and how you, we just, we have them script how they want the phone answered. We don't say, okay, to all of our offices, here's how you answer the phone. Now, we, we interact with them to find out what's important to them, what their values are, yada, yada, yada. And then we assist them in scripting how you would, they would uh, answer the phone. How would you recommend, because I was just thinking about, you know, with practices and, and turnover and staff, when there is a shared vision that was created, how do you quickly bring the new staff up to speed with that vision? That's a great question. That is a great question. So when we're hiring staff members, one of the things that we want to make certain is that in the very initial part of the interview process, we share with them this, you probably don't know this, but you know, we have some really, really cool tools that we use together that make our team incredibly strong. This particular tool is specifically, it's called our, it's called our vision statement. In fact, when they go back in the, in, in the treatment area, you'll see it hanging on the wall back there. Right. So we have the, we have the applicant read the, you know, read the vision statement. And they always ask them, okay, well, how, so how's that? Just, wow, that's very cool. I've never seen one of these in an office. Well, you're coming into a pretty special place. So uh, this is, there's a reason that we have that here. 
And then the second thing we do is have the uh, have the uh, the applicant look at our agreements. Why would we do that? Think about it. To make sure you're getting an agreement from them. This is our agreements. Going back to what you said, our agreements. Bingo. If they can't, if they cannot, if they can't, if they don't see the value in these ten or eight or seven, whatever, no, if these agreements don't resonate with them, they probably need to go someplace else. Yep. That makes yep. sense. And find the practice that more resonates with, you know, whatever their thought process is. But we start with that, and and we verify with them that that is something that they think would be really profound to have in a practice. And guess what? It's already in the practice. One other question I had that for, for you, just obviously with all your experience with kind of when you think of, you know, hospital systems and, and you know, kind of these larger groups where there's, you know, obviously management, what do you think are, what are you think are some tools that we can give them to retain some of their staff? Because obviously you're, you're working with um, practices and then you're also working with healthcare systems as well. So it's the same tools, Stacy. I mean, mm-hmm. there's really no way to create anything better. I mean, do you believe that hospital deserves the best? How long, how long would it take to get that throughout the hospital? It is not an easy, it's not an easy undertaking. We know how to do it. Uh, it is a much simpler process in a practice, but that these tools, hospitals are populated with human beings, right? These things that we've been talking about today resonate with you guys, right? So how could they possibly not resonate with team members in a hospital? Like it's a job to, 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 to put it together in a hospital and, and have it in, uh, you know, have it in place in every department. So it just, but think of the result that shows up from that. I was going to say, what what are kind of key questions that you kind of, before you start working with, um, you know, a new practice or a new system, what do you want them to kind of go through in their mind before reaching out to, to you and, and, and engaging, um, you know, with you? Well, I want, to, I want to ask them questions about what do you want mm-hmm. to accomplish? And I listen very closely to what they have to say. Of when we're teaching things, we're not telling people, do this, do this, do this, do this. We make suggestions and we listen closely to their feedback so that when we can respond with a, a, another question, if we're not clear about exactly what they meant, and we just get on the same page with them. There's a, there's a great deal. We, we have amazing rapport with our, with our, our clients. I was in an office down in Louisiana about uh, two or three days. Actually, it was last Thursday. And I've been working with this doctor for 25 consecutive years, unbroken. That's not uncommon. My average probably duration in a, in a, in a practice is typically 18, 20 years. Because they realize a, a coach's job is to get ahead of it, stay ahead of them. So when they're accomplishing yada, yada, yada that I'm – wanting to help them put in place because they said that's what they wanted. All the while, Stacy, I'm thinking about now, once that's in, what's the next step that's in, that's consistent with what they told me their vision was. Does that make sense? So you never get finished because you're always rolling out. A coach is rolling out the next step. Now, if, if the doctor were to say, you know, I'm not really interested in doing that next step, that's fine. Then, you know, I probably got other, you know, a couple other possibilities uh, this particular doctor is in the process of going through a merger with uh, with another practice. I mean, that's a that's a that's a good bit of work, also, and we're getting it done. But what do you think? He what do you think that that doctor wanted? It, the the the, uh, the other two doctors who are in the different practice. What did he want them to do? He wanted them so they wouldn't be starting from ground zero. He wanted them to have me coach them for a couple of years. It's been about a year and a half now and they are getting pretty darn close to being totally synced up. If you didn't do that, what would happen? This fine tuned practice over here brings in these new people and it's a train wreck. It brings in this new organization because they will be interfacing. This is a whole different way of doing things, but it's lasted 33 years for us and we continue to grow. There really is no competition. I've told people that all commonly. We look in the rearview mirror, Stacy, and there's no there's nobody back there. 
they don't, they're gone. They're way back. You can't even see they're around the last hill back there. You know, I don't know what they're doing, but <laughs> they're not keeping up with where we're headed. And I don't mean to sound like we have a lot of ego. We really don't. Our, our organization is made up of loving, caring people who want to make a difference, mostly godly people. And by the way, when we're working with an office, I don't get into anything religious whatsoever. I'm sharing with you guys some of what I know, who I know is guiding me. Does that make sense? And so far, it's working out pretty well. Well, in wrapping up, I'd love for Dr. Bass, just give what one tip to our audience today of something they can start, you know, implementing to see a positive result, you know, right away. Well, I would script a way to welcome your patients on the phone or coming in the door. I would take that glass barrier down. I would start getting people eye contact at the front. I mean, how far do you want me to go? It's it's all the things we've been talking about. But you can't, how do you eat, a, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. But see, we don't believe that, well, there's so many animals. I mean, there's so many bites to the animal. You, you can't, or to the elephant, rather. No, we start taking bites out of the elephant right up front. Absolutely. And I don't know if any way to compromise and to water down what we do, or if we did, we would be consultants like the ones that I was describing earlier. Now, how can any of our listeners that want to engage, um, you know, with fortune management and with yourself or, or your team, what, what should they do to reach out? Well, first of all, the fortune management medical division, I'm the director of the medical division. Okay. I'm not the director of the rest, the rest of the company. I am a co-founder and I am on the board of directors. Uh, but anyone, any physician who would like to interact with us, they can, first of all, check us out on the web, on our, on our web page. So, uh, in fact, the first page, the landing page is a great, uh, conversation there that Tony Robbins has with them. He had a, he, he wanted badly to transform medicine. We all have horror stories, right? So the bottom line is fortune spelled out fortune management, fully spelled, no abbreviation. Fortune Management MD.com. That's where they'll find the medical division. They'll and guess what? What do you think they're going to find when they go there? Besides Tony's interview and several others. A vision statement. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's our vision statement. Lisa for the win. Yeah. Slam dunk, baby. <laughs> 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 It's been such a pleasure. It's been great to connect. I know it's been a while because you're all over the place coaching everybody. And I'm one of those persons who needs a coach more than a consultant because I need hand holding and I need, you know, I need that interaction, that reinforcement, that keep doing, stop doing. And that's our goal with delivering these podcasts to our audience so that we can all become better in healthcare and, and better all around as individuals. Well, I know you're accomplishing that because I know how bright you are. And since you're hanging out with Stacy, I know she must be pretty bright also. <laughs> uh, let me just say, if there's ever anything I can do for you guys, do not hesitate to reach out. And, uh, oh, by the way, I did tell you about the Fortune Management uh, Medical Division website. The Fortune Management company per se that has everything else in it is actually uh, Fortune MGMT. Dot com, like an abbreviation for magic. Fortune M G Mary George Mary Tom. Dot com. And we will share all of that um, on you know with our viewers and put that in the the contact card and the information of the podcast so that they can quickly you know get a, a get a touch with you know you and your your larger team. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bass. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Lisa, for all your amazing co host and abilities and insights and just in bringing great guests to our show. We're, we're really, really honored to have you. Thank you to all of our listeners. If you would like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And a big thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast would not be possible. If you'd like to be a guest, please go to www.pacificcompanies.com. Thank you.